Welcome to season two of All Go If You Go, the Save the Redwoods League podcast. We're building community and illuminating how Californians from all walks of life think about and experience nature and conservation in the Redwoods and beyond. I'll go if you go, because when we explore together in community, the experience is all the more powerful. Hey friends, summer is here and the time is right for dancing in the Redwoods. I feel like I say this every time, but today's episode is truly special for a number of reasons. First, it's the final episode of season two. And what really makes today's episode special is our lovely guests, Grace Anderson and Mo Aceviomo. Grace, she, her, is a dreamer, networking weaver, and joy enthusiast based in Oakland, California. Mo, they, she, is an outdoor educator who loves cloud watching and sleeping under the sun. They are the camp co-director at Abundant Beginnings, a collectively run Black-led community education and empowerment initiative. We met up in Reinhardt Redwoods Regional Park in Oakland, which is within the unceded and ancestral homeland of the Ohlone peoples, to play in the Redwoods. What exactly does it mean to play? You may be surprised by Grace and Moe's answers to that question. The act of playing can spark so much inspiration and it led us to explore the concept of relationships with each other, with the outdoors, and with each other in the outdoors. When I was a kid, I loved playing outside. I did a lot of running around playing tag with friends or making up fantastical games or trying to climb trees. Sometimes, actually quite often, I'd fall and scrape my knees, but my dad taught me how to pick myself up, dust myself off, and get back to playing. Why waste some crying when I could be having fun? That's what worked for me anyways. The outdoors was a place where I could fall down and get back up again, where I could be me and push myself and have a good time. A place where I could play. Grace and Mo, welcome to the podcast. Thank you. Thank you, Emily. Mo has just showed up in the most lovely earth tones. (laughs) I had to tell. Love brown. I love earth tones. You look so good. <laughs> gonna come Say it again. Like Make sure the mic caught so it. so good, Mo. <laughs> thank you, thank you. I do what I can. Um, I like earlier this month, well, I guess in February for Black History Month, I had the whole theme for myself in the apartment, and it was brown is a beautiful color. Because I was just thinking about when I was younger, we were in art classes. And brown was like the color right. of poop. Right, that's always the color. Of <laughs> it was always the color yeah. of poop, and people would exactly, yeah. and people would mix the colors together and be like, "Look at my mud, poopy." And I was like, "You know what? Brown is a beautiful color, oh and it has gosh. different, <laughs> it has different, <laughs> different tones and different hues." So you ever wake up and like there's sun on your skin, and you're like, "Oh, is this me? <laughs> is this all me?" Yeah, I love that. Oh my gosh, my skin is so pretty and brown. And Yeah. I asked Grace and Mo to introduce themselves in whatever way they were showing up that day. Uh, I think what's up for me today is I'm black, I'm creative, I'm really smiley and sensitive. I, like, love black people and joy, like, being, yeah, the car ride with Mo and the speaker. <laughs> I'm like, oh, I need more of this and I want to figure out ways like just to live and bask in black joy yeah I feel like I'm in a big place of evolution and transition to what I don't know what yet but that feels pretty big I'm a cyclist Uh, I love flowers I love being outside my people are really important to me like when I love people I like love really hard Um, I want to love more people outside I think yeah, today's been really sweet so far. Oh, I should be outside with the people I love more. I would describe myself as black first and foremost. I'm a climber. I am a cloud watcher, a writer, an author. I'm Nigerian American. And I would like to think that I'm really good at listening. I also taught a class this morning a fitness class, so I feel like that feels very more relevant than others. So I feel like a coach. I was yelling at people this morning, <laughs> telling them to dig deep. <laughs> so that feels very relevant right now. So I would say coach. How do you feel about the word play? Play just like evokes like such a warm feeling in my body. It's like laughter. It's like intimacy. It's like stillness like it just feels loose and warm and giggly and joyful and it like I picture myself like tumbling 
in a delightful way, like tumbling down like a hillside, <laughs> like just rolling over and over and over again. And that doesn't like, that isn't always what play looks like for me, but that's what it feels like, just like letting go and just tumbling uh, over and over. Mm. It feels so warm though, like just like hearing that word. It's like, oh, let's go play. I'm like, oh, I wish more people would be like, oh, let's go play. Let's go play together. Yeah. <laughs> and that could mean so many things. How do you think we can play more? I had attended a goal setting workshop and it was, you know, what are your goals? And I feel such an aversion to that question. It feels like goals are, it feels rigid. It feels inflexible. Um, it feels very like failure, success, binary. Mm. And so I instead asked myself a question um, of what am I trying to honor in this life? Because I feel like that was a little more fluid. Come on. Yeah, that is a beautiful question. <laughs> it's a beautiful question that a friend of mine, Julia, had. We keep going back to it of what are we trying to honor in this life? And when I think of what it means to honor play, I think of all the things I love to do outside, like climbing and running and so, like bicycling. I don't know if I could, I, I would consider bicycling. Cycling, let's say cycling. Because for me, those things are playful. And when y'all were describing play, it sounded very serene and beautiful and nourishing. But when I think of play, I think of adrenaline. Mm -hmm. Um, like pumping, uh, kind of an intensity there that afterwards you can kind of have this fall from. Mm -hmm. And I feel like that's me in my rawest days when I'm falling from that like adrenaline high and I'm just mm -hmm. like, wow, like I'm alive. Like this is, I'm experiencing the universe. I want to hear about how you two met and how would you describe your relationship? Yeah, I love when people are like, you meet cute story. <laughs> Grace and I met in 2017. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> Just kidding. <laughs> what is time? What is time? Sometime, somewhere along then, or 2018. And Grace was one of a guest speaker in a series of guest speakers that came to talk about diversity in the outdoors at Stanford campus where I was attending at the time. And I don't remember much about what Grace spoke about except for two main things. One was when Grace was sharing about her parents and her parents' reactions to her being an outdoor educator and loving the outdoors and camping and all the things that Grace does outside and their version to it. And this was really the first time that I heard my story in someone else. And I was like, oh my goodness, that's like my parents. <laughs> right. And the second thing, and maybe Grace didn't really say this, but it was my first time seeing a black person with natural hair of my texture. Grace, would you say you're 4C? Yeah. Like with the 4C. 4C? Representation. Come on, 4C rep. That matters. It matters. It really does matter because hair is just so important yeah. in the Black experience. And with something like camping, which is not the only way to engage in the outdoors, but it's hard when you have different hairstyles. If you're wearing a wig or if you're wearing braids, well, I feel like braids are probably much easier. All to say that it really struck me that it was someone who mirrored similar aspects of my identity who was doing all these dope things and outside and I was like what who is this person and honestly that was enough I was just saying like I didn't really talk to Grace I wasn't really that vocal or like I'm not even sure if I introduced myself um like I may have but it was really just seeing Grace existing in her own vibration that made a spark for me and I remember Grace was talking about the company that she worked at and I was like I want to work at that company and I was just like I want to be like Grace oh <laughs> <laughs> uh, and you know Grace and I are very different people but we have a, like we do have a lot in common in terms of our journeys and aspects of our identity and I was really fortunate that I think the year after we met in person, Grace was also the co-director of 
the people of the global majority conference it was with billy if you haven't heard of the people of the global majority conference it gathers all of these people in the outdoor sphere conservation recreation mm -hmm. jump in grace um rematriation <laughs> yeah. all types of all, the ways. all types of ways that people engage with the earth and they're all BIPOC. They're all black indigenous people of color. And we all came to Philly and we just had a great time. Um, and we've just stayed in contact ever since. And I think something about mentorship that I want to emphasize is that it really doesn't have to be this, well, for Grace and I, it didn't have to be this continuous check-in and like frequency. I think Grace sees me and I would like to think that I see Grace as well. and. That has been the foundation of our relationship and we don't necessarily need to constantly see one another to continue to build on that foundation for me mo it's like i've just always held you like once i saw you like when i see black folks specifically like femmes and women and non-binary people who look like me like really look like me in terms of like darker skin kinkier hair like backgrounds that I have like I just can hold them and like feel like I have like this compartment in my heart of just like oh I see you and like whenever there's an opportunity to like uplift you like reflect yourself back to you like validate you affirm you like send money your way like any way that I see you possible like I'm just gonna do that and I think like in those years when I was like at Stanford and like in other spaces like I was also looking for myself I'm like okay like I'm in spaces with people of color but they don't they're still not looking like me like I'm not seeing as many black people or any black people and it's not like not looking and feeling like me and so I think that year I met you and I met Daryl and I was just like oh like I'm also searching for you <laughs> and so I've just always held you in that like I just like try to always rem like always be mindful of like what you're working on and what you're dreaming about so that if there isn't ever an opportunity where I can like support you I just do it and I think yeah I just wish I wish I I wish I had had that So both of you came to outdoor education on your own. It sounds like without much influence from family. How did you both come to it and your love for the outdoors? And also, like, what what is the outdoors? I um, grew up in Virginia and I went to a historically black college in North Carolina, um, Winston-Salem State University. And yeah, I just have never been a fan of school and structure in that way. I started as a, an elementary school teacher major and yeah, I thought I would teach kiddos inside because that's how I was taught you do it. Um, and then my junior year in college, I just like kind of stopped going to class. I was like volunteering at an AIDS cl a clinic for folks who had AIDS and HIV. Um, and I just stopped going to class and just started volunteering there all the time <laughs> and like almost didn't graduate. But um, I had a professor my junior year who was like, yeah, you don't come to my class. Like, you should check out this program instead. <laughs> and it was the Student Conservation Association, and they were doing spring break trips for college students in Joshua Tree. And so I spent a spring break in Joshua Tree, like, remo removing invasive mustards and counting desert tortoises, which Whoa. was, like, so awesome. And I was like... Oh, this is what my life. <laughs> <laughs> this was an option, <laughs> right. and that was in Joshua Tree, and it just, it just blew my mind. So I graduated with like, by the skin of my teeth, graduated, and then moved to North Dakota to teach environmental education the day after I graduated from my all black wow. college. <laughs> Wow, Grace. Yeah, you want to talk about transitions? Right. <laughs> um, and so I was a ranger there, and that's how I got into it. I just wanted to be outside and wanted to, like, figure out a way to, like, sustain myself in doing that financially. And, yeah, do not come from a family with, like, a lot of financial resources. And so 
my mom, everyone was confused, still is. Like, how are you paying rent? Um, how do you live? Um, but that's how I got into it. And I just love being outside and I love how playful it is and like serene it is and how much it's like built me up, like in terms of the skills and confidence and the community that I've built around it. But that's, yeah, that was my start. How about you, Mom? Hmm. I was thinking of when I was little in South Georgia and my siblings and I, I have seven siblings. So there's never a shortage of people to play with. Okay. <laughs> we would play outside and I just loved playing outside, like as most little kids do. And I remember I used to love taking showers outside when it was oh. raining. <laughs> um, <laughs> and, you know, I come from a family of a lineage that includes farmers, like a pretty mm -hmm. even split of farmers and those in education, which I would like to think I'm living that reality now, like those mm -hmm. two worlds as a camp director and the forest school. So maybe, hopefully my ancestors are like, we see you. Uh, yeah, that's a farmer. You're planting seeds in these kids' minds. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. You see it, right? Mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> I came to, I, well, since I was little, I wanted to be I called it chocolate granola. Oh my gosh. Yes. yes. I wanted to be that black person with like with locks, surfing and climbing. And was so cool. Granola. <laughs> chocolate granola. And I was set on it. I was set on it. And when I came to school in the Bay, it was like, I remember I bought my climbing shoes off Amazon. And I didn't, I, I knew nothing of the technical gear of the elite elitist outdoor culture that existed at Stanford and it didn't take long before I it bogged me down when mm -hmm. at Stanford I was like I this isn't actually for me this like granola dream mm, no thanks mm -hmm. I was getting I had microaggressions in the outdoors I was typically the only black person I had comments about my hair. I was stressed about my hair because mm. I I wasn't wearing my natural hair at that in that time. It just felt like it wasn't a cultural fit. I couldn't care about how I looked because you weren't supposed to care about how you looked when you were camping or when you're outside. I couldn't take pictures because you're not even though like I had never done anything like this before. Mm. And my instinct was like to take pictures and send it to my parents and like take videos because this was all so brand new. And having one of my first experiences of doing that be quickly shamed and like, oh, you're you're less you're less outdoorsy and you're you belong mm -hmm. here less if you want to capture your experiences. And really, I mean, it it was it wasn't just that. It was all these ways I existed that didn't fall within what it meant to be outdoorsy, which is, spoiler alert, like white and elitist. So I was really discouraged for about two years in college. And then I went to PGM1. That's what happened. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I was like, what happened? The People of the Global Majority Conference? I went to the People of the Global Majority Conference and it just renewed my vigor and it just mm -hmm. made me realize that the experience I had been having was one that sadly or unfortunately it's like very universal and mm -hmm. for black people for indigenous people for darker skinned people and people of color um who are made to feel like they didn't belong in the outdoors for our, our black listeners darker skinned listeners people of color listeners who hear about your relationship and communities that you have nurtured around you and in the outdoors and for our listeners who want to find community in the outdoors, do you have any tips for how they can do that? Social media, I think, is a double-edged sword in a lot of ways. Um, but that's how I've been able to connect with more people of color who are outside and darker skinned people and black people who are outside. Sometimes people are like, oh, people of color ski. I'm like, wait, white people ski? <laughs> like, because my Instagram is just like all people of color. And I'm like, oh my gosh, y'all are still climbing? White folks are climbing? <laughs> Um, 
And so I think, yeah, social media is a great way because there's so many groups that are sprouting up and using social media to like share um, like details of their gatherings um, and just what they're up to. Um, I think, yeah, I, not everyone's comfortable doing this, but I love approaching people outside. I was about <laughs> to say. Whenever I'm in the climbing gym and someone's climbing <laughs> and black, I'm like, I will find myself on the road. <laughs> like, oh, Funny hello. Funny seeing you here. <laughs> um, in Oakland, which Mo could talk about this morning, because you've attended an event, there's like the Black Climbers Collective mm-hmm. that's sprouted up. There's a lot of queer spaces in mm-hmm. Oakland for climbers and hikers. Um yeah, I feel like I think there's a lot more representation right now and like spotlighting groups and people of color who are in the outdoors. Like, I don't think it's like all of it's like equity work or like or justice oriented. I think there's a lot of like representation right now. Um, and so I think like just searching Instagram and like asking friends and approaching people like right now, there's just like it seems to be like more abundance of groups and people who are mm-hmm. organizing outside. And then, yeah, PGM1 think it's a beautiful space to engage with other folks of color who just work and like play in connection with the land uh it took me a while to realize um, <laughs> that it was less about the activities for me and more about the people mm-hmm. and so mm-hmm. i think if there's like people in your life that you love and just like love to spend time with like invite them outside with you like it is so much more about relationships for me like mm-hmm. i learned how to climb from like white men who were really into like hard sport route and i was like oh my gosh i hate climbing and then some people took me climbing who were like really into like long trad routes or like long multi-pitch routes that were just like about being together outside and like, oh, you all are my people. And then we eat yummy things afterwards. Like I think just inviting people you love to be outside with you is another way to like build community um, with people who you're already in community with. Yeah. That sounds like play. Like you're going outside not to conquer and not to win. You're going outside to play with the people you love. Yeah. It's another setting for it. Totally. That's, yeah, exactly. I mean, it's it's the universal playground. Yeah. Explore Redwoods is your portal into California's magical coast, Redwood and Giant Sequoia Forest. Visit ExploreRedwoods.org to learn what's available in more than 100 Redwood parks and plan an unforgettable adventure. From hiking and biking trails to camping to swimming holes, this web-based app will get you there. Visit ExploreRedwoods.org. Finding your happy place outside doesn't doesn't need to be a strenuous, hard thing to do. A hardship. Right? Hardship, exactly. Which is why I think there's like fear around the outdoors and like being outside because of that narrative of like, oh, it has to be hard and it's going to be mm-hmm. like painful and it's going to mm-hmm. be cold and mm-hmm. it's going to be like... There's gonna be All discomfort. Like, yeah. Yeah. And like it. And I. Oof. Have to be that. Way. And I hated that when I first started yeah. camping. It was with non-black people. It was mostly white people, and discomfort was glorified. Right. Right. It's like, oh, you have to love that coldness. You have yeah. to love when you know. When, right. Like the harder you, the harder you <laughs> suffer, the more outdoors you. Exactly. Call the food, food doesn't taste, taste good. <laughs> <laughs> You will love this food. <laughs> Wait a damn minute. Wait a second. We can break seasoning in the outdoors. <laughs> and you know what? It doesn't have to be for a long time either. You don't have to do a Rain. three day solo trip, seven day hiking expedition. <laughs> it could be it could be a short twenty minutes. Yeah. It could be an hour just napping under the sun. And then you're done. Yeah. Then you're done. You know, I feel like when once we start to constrain it, we say, this is what it means to be outside. That's when we start going wrong. I yeah. spent so much energy trying to curate the perfect pro-black, mm-hmm. pro-everything that I wish I had had experience. Yeah. And I've had people, I organized this Black Yosemite trip, try to do everything right. And I still have people be like, yeah, I just didn't like it. And I'm like, wait, <laughs> what? <laughs> what? <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> and that's okay. That's all, folks. I want to thank each and every one of you for sharing the season with me and being part of the All Go If You Go and Save the Redwoods League community. I sure learned a lot. 
about how mushrooms are grown, how to forest bathe, how to keep a nature journal. I also went skateboarding like a girl and glided down the Klamath River in Okhoyach, a Yurok redwood canoe. It's not just the activities that made this season so meaningful, though. It's the amazing people who shared their stories with us on each episode, who I got to play in the outdoors with. As I've learned through this season, play is an essential ingredient to building relationships. Play needs everyone to show up with trust and an open mind, and a willingness to be silly and get lost in the fun. I am so grateful to all of our guests for welcoming us into their worlds, playing with us in the outdoors, and expanding all of our connections to nature. If anything resonated with you this season, please write a review of the podcast or get in touch. I'd love to hear from you. I hope you join us next season for even more fun adventures, exploring our connection to nature and building community in the outdoors. If you see me somewhere outside, come and say hey. I certainly hope to see you out there. I'll go if you go.